actually nonviolence and anti-colonial struggle was the part of school curriculum. So believe it or not, the young Yugoslavs at the age of, you know, kindergarten or a little bit later elementary school would learn and be inspired by the lectures from India and Gandhi struggle, as well as a civil rights movement and various anti-colonial movements in Africa. So despite our geographical location and uh, uh, widely held belief that Yugoslavia was behind the Iron Curtain, uh, actually it was pretty open in educational manner. So uh, having this idea that mobilizing people for change, uh, starting small but dreaming big, achieving things through mass action and uh, sticking to nonviolent discipline was a part of our education, which I would highly recommend to the schools across the globe. So regardless of the of the later violent history of the region, uh, Yugoslavia, well, my country, which is now named Serbia, got involved in the civil war. About the age I was 18, I was already kind of pre-shaped in believing that the nonviolence is a far more effective, humane, and ethical path to the change. Uh, the clenched fest uh, of Otpor, which was later replicated in places like Georgia, Ukraine, or Egypt, uh, was coming from the idea that uh, we, the normal people of Serbia that were sick and tired of Milosevic rule, were the majority but very atomized majority. So the idea of the fist has less to do well. It looks badly, also looks cocky, looks like, you know, we want to fight. But the idea was coming from a slogan, which was saying, you know, it's like, get yourself together, like in the fist and live the resistance. And that was meaning get all the atomized part of society together, but also get yourself together. Because if you're living in a country which is falling apart, bombarded by the nationalist propaganda, you lose yourself. So it has to do with yourself and with ourselves, uh, if you want, in a wider context. A majority of disengaged people are not disengaged. Very rarely, they're disengaged of fear. And you can take a look at the very brutal regimes of Burma or North Korea, where people don't get involved because they're afraid. But mostly, like in Russia, for example, people don't care, or they go with the flow, or they think they can't change things. So the major main engine of status quo, if you want, in countries like India, is uh, uh, taking a look at the part of the population. Which, oh, this is politics. I don't get involved in politics. So how to engage this portion of the population in struggle, how to make these people from neutral into passive support, how to offer them call to action. So aside of just them being aware that things are wrong, you give them something to do about the fact that things are wrong. Uh, this is basically the philosophy of successful movements. First thing, is to understand that you need to find non-divisive issues. So this is tough because yeah. the people who are socially proactive are already locked in their rooms and they're locked in their chamber rooms. This is actually the challenge we are looking the most. We are looking at what may be the best blueprint for building some kind of organization decision-making process in a growingly decentralized and uh, social media connected ecosystem of the movements. Though I'm cautiously optimistic about where the society goes, I'm kind of less optimistic of how seriously we are taking the fact that we are destroying a big and very inert system. So it's very difficult to reverse this change, uh, far, far more difficult than rebuilding democracy after you know, having a bad guy in power for four or five years, it's doable. Uh, second, uh, on a very personal level, I, you know, I work with risk takers. I work with people who still have hope in places like Mali or Uganda or Burma or Nicaragua, where everybody else lost hope. And working with the people who have hope in these places and ready to take the action and just to remind you, the action in this place means you're risking your life. So these are the serious risk takers, meaning that you're working with the best part of the society. And once again, uh, uh, quoting somebody who is more wise than me, Benjamin Franklin, said there are three portions of each society. There are those unmovable, there are those movable, and there are those who move. 
and working, educating, helping those who move. This is what I do for a living. And uh, the, the fact that I'm interacting with people like that probably keeps me sane and keeps me optimistic and keeps me energized because these people are more committed than I am. They're very often smarter than I am and they are taking the larger risks than I have taken in my lifetime or would take in my future life so you know working with them kinds of inspires you and and keeps you young and keeps you on the top of the things so it's kind of a of a booster 